Hello everyone, I am Anthony Amundsen, member of the Minnesota Mineral Club and all-around geology enthusiast. Today I'm going to talk about bismuth. If you've ever seen a rock shop, you probably have seen bismuth crystals for sale. You might have also noticed that these crystals usually say they are laboratory grown. So just what is bismuth and why does it crystallize in such an interesting way? And just how does one grow a bismuth crystal? Keep watching to find out. Growing bismuth crystals requires a variety of equipment. The first thing you need is something that can survive holding the liquid bismuth without contaminating it. Plastics would melt or burn, ceramics might shatter, and even some common metals might weaken or release toxic fumes. A metal that meets our temperatures requirements is stainless steel. We also have to worry about contamination. If the bismuth metal is less than 99.9% .9 pure, the crystals will not develop that iridescent color that they're famous for. This is another reason to pick stainless steel. Stainless steel actually has a thin layer of chromium oxide on it that acts as an inert barrier, preventing anything from leaching into our bismuth from the metal of the bowl. Fortunately, stainless steel cookware works quite well and is easy to come by at your local secondhand store. I've customized some of the bowls I have to help make them safer to pick up and to hold. So this is the newest part of my bismuth making apparatus. This is a cooling kiln. I use it to control the speed at which the bismuth crystals cool, which means they can grow bigger. Um, I've had it tested up to about a thousand degrees, um, but I don't really need to get it that hot for what I'm going to do. Uh, so this cover just sits on top. You can see it's got a thermal coupled probe there so that the thermostat can regulate the temperatures. I'll show you this too. This is uh, my original cooling chamber. So as uh, the business basically needs to be cooled slowly. The slower you cool it, the bigger and better the crystals in general. So um, just leaving it out to cool in, a, in the casting vessel, that just lets it cool way too fast to get really big chunky crystals. So this was my first uh, passive cooling chamber, so it's basically, you can see there's some insulating foil, there's actually some perlite underneath there to provide some structure to the base, so it's insulated on the bottom too. But it's basically just a, you know, a double walled thermos. This is my main processing uh, rig here for the bismuth. Um, as you can see, it's an old barbecue grill. It's about perfect for making bismuth because it's designed for hot temperatures and it has plenty of workspace for me. Um, so just kind of what I got here. This is this is slag. So the, every time you heat up the bismuth, the tops of it oxidizes, and all the slag has to be skimmed off. So that's all the slag I've made since I've been working on this. Um, this here is the bismuth metal that we'll actually be uh, working on melting down today. Uh, stuff like this. As you can see, it's just kind of a shiny gray ingot form that I get. Um, and this is actually what I'll be melting here in a little bit. So as you can see, there's a lot of kind of, you know, chunky proto-crystal proto stuff in here. It's maybe, it's maybe keepable, but there's a lot better stuff that I can make out of it. So this is all going back in the pot to uh, be melted down and hopefully turned into something better. It takes about 20 minutes to melt the bismuth from cold, so let's look at some chemistry while we wait. Bismuth is one of the hundred or so pure elements that make up everything around us. It is also one of the heaviest, lying right down here between lead, antimony, and polonium. Not the best company to be sure, but despite this, bismuth is surprisingly non-toxic. In fact, there is a pinhead amount of the material distributed through every dose of Pepto-Bismol. But enough chemistry, let's go pour some bismuth. Before we get to work though, it's time to talk about safety. Pouring bismuth is like working with a deep fryer, except the bismuth is twice as hot and weighs ten times as much. While I am working, you will see me wear closed-toed shoes, long pants, a full apron, welding gloves, and safety glasses. In general, you want as much of your skin covered as possible, because this stuff will burn you really fast. Okay, so it is completely melted here, as you can see. It wobbles around a little when I shake it, so it is... Uh ready for the next step so that's basically to get ready to pour so we're going to take this liquid and we're going to put it into this uh, cooling vessel it's just a stainless steel bowl and we're going to uh, put that in the kiln and let it cool off well before we can do that uh, we have to deal with oxide so the oxide is this stuff i showed you earlier it looks pretty cool it's very colorful but it doesn't really remelt. Um, once it's oxidized, it's just oxidized. So 
all the oxide we put in there when we remelted that uh, earlier material is still here and it's all floating on top. Um, so we need to skim it off. So I got this little skimmer tool I've made here. So we can just take and skim that off. And as you can see, this creates a really cool effect when you expose the fresh molten bismuth. It immediately skins over and kind of gets that iridescent sheen to it. And here we go. Now the bismuth is uh, safely into the kiln. It's just going to cool off in there. I'll put the cover on for a couple seconds and then it gets to cool for uh, usually about 10 to 15 minutes. While the crystals are growing, let's talk about what is going on inside the kiln right now. When I removed it from heat, the bismuth was all above its melting point, which is 520 degrees. As it cools, it will eventually reach 520 degrees. Once this happens, it will be unable to cool further without freezing back into a solid. This transition from liquid to solid takes place one atom at a time. With the liquid at its freezing point, whenever an atom of bismuth runs into something, be it another atom or the wall of the cooling vessel or whatever, it may freeze to that object. Atoms are much more likely to do this when running into another atom that is already a solid, particularly if that solid is itself already crystallized bismuth. This is the key to crystal growth. Given enough time, the bismuth atoms will show a preference to freeze onto the existing bismuth, and by cooling the bismuth slowly enough, we allow the atoms this time, and get a handful of geometric crystals rather than a uniform coating on the entire surface of the bowl. When freezing onto existing bismuth, the new atoms will also prefer to line themselves up with the atoms that are already frozen. This alignment preference is called crystal structure or habit. For bismuth, this means that the atoms will prefer to align themselves to form rectangular prisms. The stair-step hopper crystal effect is actually caused by the sides of the cube not being fully filled in. Unfortunately, we can't see this happening in the bismuth, though, because it's opaque. The remaining liquid hides what's going on from us. The only way to see it ourselves is to pour off the excess liquid before it finishes freezing. So let's go check on it. Okay, so if you can see it when I nudge this here, you can see it wobbles a little. You can see that there's a solid part in the center, which means we're about solidified. Um, which means it's probably about a good time to pour off the excess metal and see what we grew. So as soon as I pour off the excess, I take and put a cover on it. The cover will help it cool a little bit slower. That helps build up a nice oxide layer on the crystals, which is what gives them their nice iridescent sheen. So while our previous crystal cools, now we get to start heating up the excess we poured off here. And uh, we can work on melting that back and starting another round. So despite bismuth being a metal, the easiest way I've found to break it up is to actually use a hammer and chisel. So this is my uh, highly sophisticated and technological anvil. I put the paper on it to make sure the bismuth doesn't uh, get on the ground because you don't want it to be too contaminated. And then if I get a, you know, the bit ingots are pretty big, I don't want to take this, you know, whole thing and it won't fit in the melting pot. So if I need to, you know, break it in half, it's just couple hits with the hammer and it will break right in half for you. So now that we have the pieces cut we can add them to the melt pan. Let's put this on fast forward. While the bismuth melts I will note that there are actually several ways to make crystals. What I am showing is the pour method. It creates bismuth geodes by pouring off the excess liquid. There is also a way to grow individual crystals that is a bit safer because you don't actually pour the bismuth. This way involves suspending a wire into the liquid as a nucleation site. Crystals will grow on the wire and then you pull it out taking the crystal with. You have to be very careful with this to pull it out before the crystal actually hits the bottom of the bowl, otherwise it'll freeze on and then you'll be stuck. I'll make another video on that method once I get a little more practice. Another interesting thing you will notice about bismuth is that, like water, it gets less dense when it freezes. This means that the solid pieces will float in the liquid.
Now that we have this all melted, we can pour and start the process over again. Since we have seen this part before, I will fast forward through the cooling process. Now that the bismuth is done cooling, we can again pour off the extra. The best part is always seeing what is growing below the surface. After the bismuth has fully cooled, we can knock it out of the bowl. So this part here is just from the pour. It gets stuck on the side. It's just recycled. So this is the second one we made. And as you can see, it's got some crystals already peeking through here. So we'll just see what we found on this side. So we've got another of these skins on top. These are good because most of the oxide gets stuck on the skin. So it's so brittle, you can just kind of peel this back. Not much on that. And see what you have underneath. We've already got a pretty nice piece getting exposed right here. We'll have to see if we can get the rest of the skin off of him. Okay. So sometimes they grow down from the surface and sometimes they grow up from the bottom, as I said before. So what we have here is a nice little stair step that grew down from the surface. This one's more of a variegated stair step that grew down from the surface. And then this is the base of that pyramid that hit the bottom and fanned out. So you get many pieces and then the rest of this outer ring I can probably clean up and then that guy can be wire wrapped and this ring will show up pretty nice. While we look at the results of the day's work, I would like to thank everyone for watching. It is always fun to share information and ideas with people and I hope you have found this presentation interesting. Thanks for watching.